Um, today we're going to be talking about bradykinesia. We're going to be breaking down bradykinesia. And that's an interesting topic because, you know, it's not one that we've actually specifically discussed before. It's been brought up, obviously, um, in the context of motor symptoms that you might experience with Parkinson's. And we've talked in specifics of some of those motor symptoms, such as tremors. Um, but I don't think that we've ever really focused specifically on bradykinesia. And it seems like it would just be a simple thing uh, around being slower in our movements, but um, I guess there's a lot more to it. And that's what we're here to learn today. Um, with us today is Dr. Alfonso Fasano. He is the Chair of the Neuromodulation and Multidisciplinary Care at University of Toronto and University Health Network. He's a professor in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Neurology at the University of Toronto. He's staff neurologist and co-director of the Surgical Program for Movement Disorders at Toronto Western Hospital University Health Network. So I wanna welcome Dr. Fasano. He is going to do a presentation on this and um, then we're gonna do some questions at the end. So if you wanna open up your chat box, that's where your questions are gonna go. And I'll just let you know right up front that we are recording today's program and it will be available available in the next day or so. He has shared some slides with us that we will add to that. So those will be available as well. So now I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Fasano. Hello, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. It's uh, really a pleasure to talk about, in general, medical topics. And this is for sure one of the interesting ones that not everybody really has, has a good, good grasp of. Uh, including doctors. Uh, so uh, in case you never heard of the term bradykinesia, uh, you are not the only one. And also people who should know the term don't know it and don't use it. So really happy to be with you all uh, today. And uh, um, I see that uh, you're really all over the place. I mean, Palm Desert and Chicago. So I'm, 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 I'm really happy to talk to you all. Uh, so I want to share my screen, first of all, so that you can see it. Uh, you can see my presentation. And like I said, the topic today will be uh, breaking down bradykinesia. And the reason why I uh, uh, was uh, asked to give this talk, I, I'm assuming, is, is because uh, I published uh, not a long time ago a paper uh, on uh, what bradykinesia is, what's not known about bradykinesia, and what we need to do moving forward to understand it better. But generally speaking, uh, I need to to be aware of the fact that bradykinesia is really what drives most of, this, of the disability in Parkinson's disease. Uh, simply put, bradykinesia means uh, problems with the uh, speed of movement, so moving slowly. Um, and that's really what bothers people. It's not tremor. Yeah, tremor can be bothersome, but not so much. Um, it might be embarrassing maybe, but really what matters to people is the ability to move smoothly and to move fast without being you know, all of a sudden stuck. And this is all under the umbrella term of bradykinesia. Uh, again, for your knowledge, uh, doctors, when they talk about Parkinson's disease, they really look at four major um, symptoms. Bradykinesia, which is the one that we uh, really focus on today, but not only today. Tremor. Then there's rigidity, which is the stiffness, the muscle stiffness. Uh, that, and that's the reason why people are, um, you know, doctors, when they see you, they will move your arms and your wrist. That's because they want to appreciate the stiffness of the muscle. But usually that's not even appreciated by, by patients. So people don't even know about it. Uh, and even though it's one of the criteria, one of the signs that we look at uh, when we assess Parkinson's disease. And lastly, there is balance problems. Of these four um, signs or symptoms, uh, the most important is bradykinesia. And, and it's not just because, as I mentioned already, bradykinesia it is, is what uh, drives most of the disability, but also because uh, according to the criteria that we have, the clinical criteria for the, the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, we need to see bradykinesia. Without bradykinesia, we don't care. So you might have someone with tremor, with stiffness, and yet we are not allowed to call that particular person as a par person with Parkinson's disease. So this is just to give an idea how important this term is. 
So these are my disclosures. I have a conflict of interest with different entities, but nothing is really relevant to what I'm going to tell you today. And actually, as a matter of fact, all these people you see listed in my disclosures, which are pharmaceutical companies, companies doing deep brain stimulation devices, don't have really good treatments for uh, one particular aspect of bradykinesia that is called sequence effect. And I'll tell you a bit more about it. So this is the paper I want uh, to uh, focus on today. That's the paper I mentioned earlier when we were trying to redefine bradykinesia. And this is something that uh, I've been um, uh, happy uh, uh, to be involved with uh, because it's uh, done by esteemed colleague of mine, but also dear friends. Uh, the first order, Matteo Bologna, is a friend that I, that I used to work with in um, uh, when I was in Rome. Alberto Space, a dear friend of mine, uh, also neurologist working in Cincinnati. Uh, then you might have heard of Mark Hallett. Mark Hallett just retired. Is one of the most influential uh, uh, researchers in this field and is in Bethesda. He was the uh, section head of uh, the Movement Disorder Control Unit of the uh, uh, NIH. And, and then also uh, Alfredo Berardelli was one of the historical leaders in this field in, in Italy. So that's um, uh, uh, the people I uh, had the chance to work with when we put together uh, this idea of the Bradykinesia complex. Uh, I don't want to get too technical and I'll try to simplify the message, uh, but uh, we call all of these different manifestations Bradykinesia. But in reality, if you want to be precise, we need to uh, look at different aspects of this big chapter called bradykinesia. That's why we use the term complex, the complex of bradykinesia presentations. So bradykinesia, when we talk about it per se, means moving slowly. It comes from the Greek term. Uh, uh, it's a combination of brady, which means slow, and kinesia, which means movement. And in order to assess bradykinesia, we need to obviously observe how uh, the person moves, but it's not just how they move, but also uh, how they move when they do the same action over and over. You might wonder why your neurologist asks you to do this. Nobody goes around at home doing this. That's not really needed or this. Uh, but what the doctor uh, looks at when they ask you to do this is uh, how you perform as the movement goes on. Because you may do very well at first, but then over time, things might change. So that's why we typically assess bradykinesia asking uh, a person with Parkinson's to move, and not just to move once, but to move multiple times. And that has to do with another term that I already introduced you to, which is sequence effect. Sequence effect means that as you move, the more you move, the, the less um, ample the movement is. So the amplitude of the movement decreases. So you might start very well, but then over time, there's a reduction. So bradykinesia means slow. Uh, sequence effect means that it's not just slow, but little by little, these movements get smaller and smaller. That's hypokinesia. So hypokinesia, again, another combination of two Greek words. You know what kinesia means. Hypo means uh, um, low. So slow brady low hypo uh, so this means that the movements are not just slow but also small in amplitude and sequence effect is when this amplitude little by little decreases and that's what really makes the difference and i'll show you an example in a second so in the assessment of bradykinesia obviously we look at the hypokinesia as well but we par pay particular attention to the sequence effect because that's very specific of the disease um, the acetations or halts that you see there are also called motor blocks is when, let's say you're doing this and then there's maybe some reduction, the sequence effect, and then all of a sudden you don't move anymore for a second or two and then you start again. So when you have a little bit of excitation, even at the beginning of the movement, they ask you to do a movement and at first you don't do it, they may have a little bit of shaking and then you start. So this is another part uh, of the bradykinesia complex and the typical example uh, that I'm sure you're familiar with is freezing of gait. Freezing of gait at the end of the day is a, is a, is a halt, is a motor block. 
or another one uh, is start hesitation when someone is about to start walking and he shakes on the spot it looks like a tremor of the knee but it's not real tremor it's really the hesitation it's the body that tries to make the movement but the movement is difficult to initiate and sometimes it's not just that the movement that doesn't start at all so it's a complete frozen state that we call akinesia which means no movement so a before any word means not not of that none of that so akinesia means no movement so see uh, you go home today also learning some greek and finally we have oligokinesia uh, this is a term we came up with it's a new term um, and this means uh, um, few movements it means fewer movements oligo means small amount in, in greek so again few amount a small amount of movements and this is a term that we introduce to describe those phenomena during which the person is moving, maybe without any slowness, but some accessory movements that the person has are not seen. I'll give you an example. When we walk, we all swing our arms, and that's an automatic behavior. We have a number of automatic behavior in our body. Another one would be blinking as we talk or we just watch TV or moving the hands when you're talking. So all these accessory movements, which are automatic, tend to reduce in Parkinson's disease. And so we, uh, obviously this belongs to the chapter of bradykinesia, and we wanted to emphasize this other part, which is basically a reduction of the mobility associated to the spontaneous or automatic movement. So this is you know, I know a big table is a complicated table. I already threw at you a lot of terms, but this is just to say that we don't just look at the velocity, at the speed of the movement, but at many other features, how smooth it is, if there are rests, uh, if there's mole, uh, if they change over time, if there is all of a sudden no movement, or if there are no accessory movements associated with it. Um, so I uh, put this into context and uh, we uh, uh, also wanted to emphasize the relationship between amplitude and velocity. So sometimes you will see people that do a smaller movement and they try to go faster to compensate. So sometimes there is an inverse relationship between the amplitude and the velocity. Uh, another typical example would be when people walk and they have short steps. So there is some hypokinesia, but there is also excessive uh, repetition of the same movement trying to compensate. And that's also part of the same chapter. Um, we didn't want to go there for the simplicity, but in case you wonder, that's called tachykinesia, so, which is the opposite of brady. It's fast movements. This is to say that uh, uh, it's not just pathological when the movement is slow, but also when the movement is too fast. And that too fast movement is because the brain is trying to compensate. So... Uh, Ideally, we want a certain movement to happen at a certain rate. For example, when we walk, we usually walk at the speed of one meter per second. If we are walking slower than that, we have bradykinesia. But sometimes because of the short steps, which is hypokinesia of the steps, uh, the body tends to compensate and the steps are happening more often. And, and paradoxically, the body starts to go faster and faster and faster. And that's called tachykinesia. So faster movement, but also faster movement is uh, a problem. And uh, also you see in this graph that the, the, it's important to repeat the movement so that we can appreciate the sequence effect and the occurrence of hesitations or holds. The last term that I want to tell you about today, uh, just for your own knowledge, because it's written there, is the term eukinesia. So when you see the two letter E and U, uh, it's the opposite or this uh, in Greek again. Euk means good. Eukinesia means good movement. Uh, so now uh, let's have a look at the video of this person that I met a while ago. This was a woman that came to see me uh, because she was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease uh, and she was very slow at doing everything. Uh, just want to stop the video because I'm sensitive it's uh, you know privacy of uh, people is important i want the face to be visible um so these movements for sure is slow but if you pay attention closely 
you will see that uh, there is no uh, decrement, there is no sequence effect. The moon is slow, but there is no hypokinesia, so the amplitude is good. It's just slow, and there's no hypokinesia nor sequence effect, which is the progressive reduction of the movement. And obviously, there is no hesitations or motor block or halt. So this is not a real bradykinesia. Technically speaking, yes, it's slow movement, but this is not Parkinson's. And actually, this woman had depression. Because of depression, she was moving slowly. Uh, another cause for moving slowly, uh, moving slowly would be pain. Some people in pain don't move well because otherwise they have more pain or low thyroid hormones. So this is just to say that there are many reasons for people to be slow. And that's why we cannot only focus on the, the velocity or the speed of the movement. We need to look at additional features, in particular, the sequence effect. So this woman is not Parkinson's because there is no sequence effect. And what is this sequence effect? So this is a complex video coming from the Bronte Stewart lab in Stanford. He's a man with Parkinson's. Uh, let me show you, first of all, what you're seeing here. This man has Parkinson's disease, and he has electrodes in the brain, particularly in a target called subthalamus, which is a part of the brain that we stimulate with deep brain stimulation, or DBS. And what you see here, this red, this is the recording from the brain, and this red at around the 20 hertz is what we call beta band. We now know that in Parkinson's, the slowness comes from this excessive uh, uh, beta band. So there's too much oscillations. The neurons in this part of the brain are oscillating all at once at around 20 hertz, so 20 times per second. And that's correlated to uh, slowness. So this is what you're seeing. And more importantly, what you see at the bottom is how the, the, this person moves the hands, going right and, uh, sorry, up and down, okay, with, with the hand. So you see these lines going up and down. So let's see what happens as he moves more and more. See, this is the sequence effect. This is a progressive reduction of the amplitude until he has almost a motor block, because you see the line is also flat. It's almost flat. So that's a typical sequence effect of the arms. Another situation where you can have sequence effect are the feet. And you will see that right before a freezing episode, the, the, the step length tends to reduce. And you pay attention here. And then there's a model block, which is in this case freezing of gait. Now, in some people, you might have sequence effect without the model block. I mentioned earlier, you might have a sequence effect, so steps getting smaller that terminate with a motor block. But in some people, the step length gets smaller and smaller and smaller without any motor block. And what happens in this case, the body tends to catch up and to go faster and faster and faster to keep the same speed. And this creates a vicious circle through which faster and faster the steps will become. And uh, the trunk tends to lean forward. And the person basically is trying to chase their own base of support and, and you'll see what happens usually in these cases. So you see the progressive reduction of the step. And now she goes back. Yes, she's supposed to go sit back to the chair. And this is what happens often in these cases. So these people sometimes, unfortunately, fall forward or they need to fall onto furniture or they need to grab something or somebody. So this is something that is quite uh, common in a way, but it's poorly recognized, especially by uh, the non-doctors. Uh, and the technical term for this phenomenon, the phenomenon you just saw, is gait festination. So festination means speeding up in Latin. So today you're learning also Latin. Festination of gait. Another phenomenon is the slow writing and the small writing. So this is a person with Parkinson's, right-handed, and is, is uh, 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 writing. And this means in Italian today is a uh, nice sunny day. And you see that the more he writes, the, the smaller it gets. And sometimes even shorter, you use less space on the page. And on your right, you see the effect of treatment. He was started on a dopamine agonist, and there was enough for him to have bigger mobility. You, you can recognize the O 
at the end of sole. Sole means sun. You see that the O is very small and it gets smaller. And you can see actually here it gets bigger. Uh, so macrographia, which means small writing, is another phenomenon that we see related to bradykinesia. Um, another phenomenon, now we're going into the spontaneous movement, and that's an example of oligokinesia, is the lack of arm swinging. So in this case, it's a complete lack of arm swinging when the person moves. You can also recognize short steps. That's, again, a bradykinesia, the walking, and hypokinesia at the same time. And this is the same person 10 years later after DBS. So DBS helps. She's doing better. But you can still see that the right side in particular is not swinging too much. And that's something that happens quite early in Parkinson's disease, sometimes even before the person realizes it, in for sure years before the disease is diagnosed. And that's why sometimes people go to see uh, the orthopedic surgeon because they have shoulder issues. Because without moving the arms during walking, the joint gets rusty. And that's why over time there might be shoulder pain because of the lack of this movement that we have when we walk. Uh, and I think this was my last video. I wanted to give you just a, a quick introduction to the topic so that we can spend the next 40 minutes uh, of this uh, webinar today to answer your question. And I see that there's something already in the chat box, uh, but I give it, uh, give the uh, mic back to Anissa so that she can uh, share this uh, Q&A part. <clears throat> Excuse me, awesome. So thank you for outlining this. So it was interesting because um, especially the, the video or, or at least the example you showed of micrographia, it seems as though bradykinesia is very much tied to rigidity. And usually we think of micrographia being just a rigidity issue and not a bradykinesia issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very good comment. Uh, um, and in a way it is the same, uh, it's not the same thing, but it comes from the same dysfunction of the brain. So um, for example, I mentioned earlier that we know what happens in the brain when we have this slowness and that's the beta activity in the brain uh, and the beta also correlates to rigidity so uh, it's true that uh, if you have severe bradykinesia you also end up having severe rigidity and vice versa uh, even though they mean different things and that's why when we classify the disease simply simply speaking we try to classify the disease in three ways tremor dominant when people have a lot of tremor and less slowness and less rigidity rigid akinetic when there's rigidity and, and slowness and then mixed when there's really a combination of the, the different aspects that I mentioned already. So in a way you're right, but technically speaking, what's causing the slow or the small writing is bradykinesia, it's not the rigidity, but they come together. So is bradykinesia present in atypical Parkinsonisms? such as PSP, MSA, CBD. We actually just had a conversation yesterday around some of the atypicals. Um, and if it, if it is, does it present the same? Yeah, very good question also. Uh, bradykinesia is the key on any Parkinsonian syndrome. We call this big chapter on neurology Parkinsonism. So something that looks like Parkinson's disease might be Parkinson's disease itself, but can be also a number of other diseases. You mentioned a typical Parkinsonism, uh, but also drug-induced Parkinsonism, stroke in the brain. So anytime you have uh, something that we call Parkinsonism, there should be bradykinesia. Now, is the same bradykinesia? Well, bradykinesia in these conditions tend to be, tends to be more symmetrical. So both sides of the body are affected to the same extent at the same time, uh, and it tends to be more severe. And people have looked into how to differentiate the bradykinesia of PSP, for example, uh, but also or the bradykinesia of uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, yes, they came up with the idea that bradykinesia is worse in a typical Parkinsonism, but it's also associated with less sequence effect. So some people are arguing that in a typical Parkinsonism, there is no sequence effect, but not everybody agrees. I personally not, don't agree with that. It's just that if you have a very severe bradykinesia, you start moving very slow already and very small. It's difficult even for the naked eye to see the sequence effect. 
as opposed to when you start very big and nicely at the beginning. And then obviously it's easier for you to see the decrement. That's why we don't see too much sequence effect in a typical Parkinsonism. But simply put, they have bradykinesia and it's more severe. We had a question, um, how freezing of gait ties in with bradykinesia. I know you showed it, so if you yeah. could get into that. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, so freezing of gait uh, is defined as the inability to move uh, the steps, uh, to move the legs, even when the person wants to do so. Um, but there's a different, a variety of different manifestations. Uh, freezing of gait can swing from complete frozen state, akinesia, to moving, but sometimes having some motor blocks and then recovering again. So why do they, we call everything freezing of gait anyways? Because in the freezing of gait, there is bradykinesia of the lower limbs. So the legs don't move as fast or as big as we're supposed to. And that comes with a number of other compensations that the brain um, uses. Uh, and this is trying to move. That's why it looks like you have a tremor on the legs or going faster. So making steps more often to compensate for the short steps. At the end of the day, uh, freezing of gait can be seen as a motor block at the end of a sequence effect involving the legs. So slow and small leg movement eventually resulting in, in an hesitation or a motor block. So we're getting some questions and they kind of all tie together. So one of the questions I had for you was, does physical therapy help with aspects of bradykinesia? Someone was asking if exercise can help and another was asking, you know, their, their spouse has gotten to the point of progression where they're freezing, there's weak and pain, you know, weakness and pain. And so they don't want to walk. Mm -hmm. What role does physical therapy and exercise play in addressing bradykinesia? Yeah, so I'll discuss, first of all, um, physiotherapy and exercising, and then I'll talk about weak and painful, these two objectives that have been used. Uh, so as for the exercise, uh, needed, in, um, uh, needless to say, exercise is fundamental. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very important uh, and is as important as not prescribed enough uh, it's been also shown, for example, that aerobic exercise uh, protects the disease from progression. So the more active you are, the better it is. But when we look at bradykinesia, uh, um, I want to um, start with an example. Uh, there are some um, uh, people with Parkinson's disease, with freezing of gait, for example, that can't move unless they are challenged with something. That something can be a sport that they used to do or a, an obstacle that they need to cross. Um, and so this is just to say that the brain has the capabilities to bypass the problem that we call bradykinesia. The problem is that we don't always have full access to these capabilities. Not always we know which ones are the strategies to use. And this is where a physiotherapist can help you with because they can teach you how to overcome the problem bypassing this block that there is in a certain part of the brain. Uh, and we know this from many other evidence. Uh, one example I always make is about an earthquake that uh, we had um, five to 10 years ago in central Italy. Uh, and this was a ba bad earthquake. A lot of people died, unfortunately. And um, there were some uh, people with Parkinson's on a wheelchair. They were so scared during the earthquake that they stood up and started running and they ran faster than the other people. So this is called Kinesia Paradoxa. So it's a paradoxical improvement of mobility. And again, emphasizes the fact that there are um, uh, resources in our brain, in our body that we don't fully understand and we don't fully use. In this particular example, it was probably the adrenaline, the fear that drove uh, the whole movement. An improvement. And interestingly, this improvement didn't uh, uh, last just a couple of days. It lasted until six to 10 months after the earthquake. Uh, and there are many other examples. I can tell you people that used to play basketball and they are freezing, but then you give them a basketball and they are uh, they are happy to, uh, to use it and they start using it and they move. And for some reason, the legs move. That's because, again, we bypass the block in the basal ganglia, which is the but where the pathology of Parkinson's lies. 
Um, and the goal of the physiotherapist is teaching, teaching you all these tricks, which are very individualized. Everybody's different. Everybody has a different capaci uh, capacities and the body is different. Uh, and uh, so, but um, the, you, might, you might wonder, okay, do I need a physiotherapist? You need it for a number of reasons. Uh, I will mention two, safety at first, because you don't know how much you can do on your own. And second, um, motivation. Unfortunately, one of the problems of Parkinson's disease is lack of motivation. So you might know that if you think about stepping on an obstacle, you move, but you don't do it because you are not motivated. You are not motivated to exercise. And so it becomes a vicious circle. Uh, and this is where uh, an external person can trigger additional improvements. Uh, and lastly, I wanna say weak and painful. Um, so Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism in general, don't affect uh, the strength. They don't affect the power of the muscle. It's true people feel weak. The, the, the brain perceives a sort of a muscle fatigue because it's difficult to move. But per se, if we were to measure the strength, there is not a real weakness. Uh, stroke can cause a weakness. Myopathy, neuropathies can cause weakness, but not Parkinson's disease. Uh, but it's been also found that if the exercise involves muscle training, so enhancing the strength, that can be beneficial, which is something new because in the past we were saying, you know, strength is not affected, don't bother uh, working on the muscle ex it itself. And lastly, painful. Muscle pain usually comes from severe rigidity and more than rigidity, sometimes it's something we call dystonia. So it's cramping, let's say cramps of the muscles. Um, so not really related to bradykinesia, but if you feel weak because of bradykinesia and you don't move because of that, and also the pain doesn't help and you don't move because of that, guess what? If you don't use it, you lose it. And once again, it's why you need to have a physiotherapist that tells you, no, no, what are you doing? You need to do more here uh, so that you get away, get out of this vicious circle. So that kind of goes along with the, the comment question of this person says that there are significant other uh, gets fatigued more when they're exercising and wanted to know if that's common with repetitive movements. Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. Um, so the, um, there are a couple of things. So generally speaking, if you don't move much, uh, when you start moving, you don't feel good about it. Um, during the very beginning of the pandemic, I spent, I think the first week at home in my living room working my computer on papers or seeing patients virtually and I remember the Monday the following Monday I went to the hospital I usually walk to work and I felt it was difficult for me to walk it was more work than usual this is just to say that in, there's this phenomenon called deconditioning that the less you move the less likely you will be moving because we don't just move using our brain we move using our joints our lungs our heart so if we don't move much, it becomes more effortful, effortful to do it. So uh, a good strategy in these cases is not to um, push through it, not to overdo it because it might be dangerous. You might actually injure yourself or create some you know, heart issue. Uh, it's important to do this, again, supervised in a progressive way so that you do, I don't know, the first day, half an hour on the treadmill, the second day, half an hour, but the third day you do 31 minutes and so forth. So always more, never less. And this way in a progressive fashion without uh, you know, getting too much uh, into shortness of breath or similar things, you, you do more and more. So, and the key is in any case to keep a steady level of activity. Um, um, yeah, I think that was the question. Anything else that I didn't, uh, yeah, it's about my, oh yeah, the, I want also to say that part of fatigue uh, because now I read the, the, the question again. Um, the term fatigue can come from this deconditioning, which we can infer comes from the lungs, the heart, the muscle themselves. But it can also be called, it also be related to something that we used to call central fatigue, which is more of a condition, it's more of a mental condition, is this perception that we are tired, even when actually the body is not. And that, that has to do more with uh, depression, with uh, the brain pathology itself, with the idea that uh, uh, we, the, with apathy, with lack of motivation. So there are different components to what we call fatigue. 
So also, if you're curious about um, whether bradykinesia can affect other things, such as the voice, speech, uh, the face, facial expressions, we know there's rigidity and facial masking, but is there other presentations that people might not consider as being part of that? Yes, I'm glad um, for this question because um, I was thinking about um, discussing speech as well. And the reason I didn't do it is because when you show videos of spe uh, people speaking, you end up showing their faces and I didn't want to do that. Um, uh, but uh, for sure, speech is severely affected by bradykinesia. And at the end of the day, what really contributes to poor quality of life is not, um, is not um, you know, tremor or rigidity. Uh, it's not dyskinesias, which are the involuntary movements. It's really the ability to go from A to B, so walking, and the ability to be understood. So communication is a big problem. And uh, there are others, uh, factors affecting quality of life in case you wonder. Another big one, we already talked about it, is pain. Another one is um, constipation. So again, we are focusing too much on the old parts of what we consider to be Parkinson's disease. Uh, communication is important. I don't have to tell you. And unfortunately, the disease affects communication at different levels. So let's see what we can talk about. So uh, one um, term that we use in speech disorders of Parkinson's is the term hypophonia. And now we know hypo. Hypo means uh, small amplitude. Hypophonia means uh, that um, means that the speech has a low volume. And that's because the volume is pretty much like in a, an accordion. So when we see someone playing an accordion, the, the fastest and the more ample the movement is, the louder the, the sound. We generate sound with our diaphragm pushing air out of our lungs. And the sound is modulated by our vocal cords and the rest of the muscles in the mouth and the tongue. But the first part is pushing air out. And this is affected in Parkinson's because of the slowness of the diaphragm, um, which is a big muscle uh, basically moving the, the chest up and down. So um, uh, because of that, you may have low volume of speech. But it's not just the volume. It's also how we articulate the speech. Um, and this is why sometimes the, the volume can be loud, but the speech is not intelligible. And this is what we call dysartria. And that has a little bit to do with bradykinesia because it, in any case involves the mobility of the muscles of the mouth and the tongue. Um, and sometimes people tend to talk fast uh, to compensate. It's actually, like I mentioned earlier, fascination for gait. We have a similar thing for speech and that's called uh, tachyphemia, so talking fast. And exactly like freezing of gait, you can have freezing of the speech. So people might have a stutter, uh, which is like a freezing, or they can even have a block and they can't produce the word, which is different from knowing the word and not getting it right away. That's another phenomenon that has nothing to do with memory, nothing to do with speech. So I don't want to go off track, but there are many things that can affect uh, our ability to communicate. And in short, bradykinesia is for sure one of it. Sorry. <clears throat> I keep coughing. So, um, okay. And the other question that just came in kind of goes back to what you were talking about earlier was the fatigue. So if somebody is experiencing that, should they push through it? Is it mental? Will their body be able to handle that? Since you were talking about the fact that it's, it's not that they aren't able to be strong. It's just, it's, uh, just the body's perception of being tired, will it be okay the next day? So is that smart or wise for people? And again, yeah. I mean, you're probably going to say, talk to your physical therapist. <laughs> well, the, the way to talk, the reason to talk about the physiotherapist is to really make sure that it's just uh, an internal experience uh, that is not coming from heart problems um, that can happen. You know, we all get older day by day and these problems can happen. It's not asthma. It's not something else. It's not... Uh, the muscle not performing well. But if it's a completely an internal experience of feeling fatigue, uh, I would still say do in a progressive fashion. Don't push through. Because one thing that I'm sure you all, ex well, not, not everybody, but some of you experience experiences uh, is the, uh, is the uh, feeling drained the next day. If you feel drained the next day, it means you did too much the day before. So you need to do 
progressive increase. The goal is never go backwards. Try to stay at the same level of activity, possibly more little by little, but never backwards, because otherwise you get into this vicious circle, because the less you move, the less you are on a, uh, the more you are on a couch watching TV all day long, the less likely you'll be able to sustain even going uh, outside to, you know, to throw the garbage. Uh, so it's important to, to keep a steady level of activity. Are there really uh, any specific treatments that radiokinesia responds well to? I mean, I know you were mentioning that it it's not there doesn't have a specific treatment, but besides physiotherapy, um, and uh, I know you mentioned DBS was helpful. Is there anything that can be done? Well, drugs help. Uh, the, the The thing is that drugs don't do drugs as well as surgery don't do everything. It's in, in, the, in the treatment of this disease is always a combination of multiple things that uh, you should do: level of exercise, level of activity, physiotherapy in certain situation when you want to address particular problems, or at the beginning of your journey, or or towards uh, you know other stages when there are more particular problems like PISA syndrome. I've so I've seen that it's been uh, mentioned um, medications for sure. Actually, medication sometimes is a step that is needed. So there is a moment in the disease where you can deal with it without medications, just with exercise. But then over time, you need to have some medication on board. Otherwise, you are not able to do a good exercise. And, be, and so with medication on board, it becomes easier for you to exercise and therefore it becomes a virtuous circle. Um, the example I always uh, tell my patients is uh, it's like when you go on a uh, you want to do a race with your car, but you forgot to put fuel in the tank. So you need to have something to, to give you the ability to move better so that you can help yourself more. And then in some cases, DBS is needed. Um, this is what I do. Most of my um, practice is focused on DBS, but this is when medications are no longer effective. Um, and again, uh, same answer, uh, DBS can help. Uh, DBS can also worsen uh, bradykinesia, exactly like medication. Sometimes too much levodopa causes more freezing. That's uh, known now. Uh, so it's always a matter of uh, combining in a very uh, wise way the multiple uh, strategies and options we have. And physiotherapy and exercising is certainly one of that. Uh, there are other ways, by the way, uh, to exercise. Sometimes there's uh, uh, more engaging ways, um, and I can think of two right right, right away. Uh, for speech, singing can be good because with singing you're forced to move your diaphragm diaphragm more. Uh, I hope you're a good singer because in case you are not, poor the people around you. Uh, and then uh, another one is dancing. Dancing, for, for in particular, tango uh, uh, helps mobility in general, also balance. Um, there is tai chi. There are many other options that can be considered. Oh, we have an interesting question. Do uh, high temps and heat during the summer cause or increase bradykinesia? Oh, yeah. Um, not necessarily affecting bradykinesia per se, uh, but um, I, I'm sure you have seen sometimes your phone. Um, for example, it happens to me uh, with my iPhone that uh, if I leave it under the sun, at some point the phone uh, turns off and you will see on the screen something like you know for safety reasons the phone is now stopped uh it's stopping working because it's too hot uh, so anything uh works within a certain temperature if it's too cold nerves don't work well you actually you can you can tell during the winter if you want to um, handle your car keys and it's too cold you don't even feel the keys and that's because the nerves don't work well same thing when it's too hot. So the, the nervous system works within a certain range of temperature, and then this is where it gives the, its best. Um, so obviously in a disease that affects the brain already, uh, the brain becomes more sensitive to extremes, uh, and if it's too cold or it's too hot, uh, makes things worse. Another important factor in this case, and this is something we're going to be discussing more and more, unfortunately, because of global warming, is low blood pressure. Parkinson's is also associated to variability of blood pressure. And uh, there's something called orthostatic hypotension. So that when you stand up, the blood pressure drops. And this drops even more if it's hot and especially when it's humid. That's another thing that contributes to the feeling of fatigue, especially after you go uh, as you go on with your mobility. Wonderful. So um, I did have a curi uh, curious question about 
bradykinesia and dyskinesia occurring simultaneously. So we've got yeah. <laughs> kind of what seems like two opposite ends of the spectrum. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are different scenarios to it, and it's true they can uh, occur together. L let's let's specify first what dyskinesia means. Uh, well, we all know Greek now, and I told you that you you kinesia means good movement. This kinesia means bad movement. In but in Parkinson's in general is used to indicate the involuntary movements caused by levodopa. Uh, so back to the scenario. There are scenarios where um, uh, levodopa at a high dose is needed to improve certain bradykinesias, typically walking, but these high doses are associated with uh, involuntary movements. So because with this progression, the brain becomes more sensitive. So the neurologists eventually can go as high as they want. They need to keep a level of levodopa that yes, cause dyskinesias, but at least helps a little bit the mobility. That's why you have a combination of slow movement and dyskinesias. Another scenario is what's called biphasic dyskinesias. Um, and that's something you need to be aware uh, of. Biphasic dyskinesia means that the dyskinesia is not caused by too much medication, but it's caused by too little medication. Uh, important for you to know, because you may need to tell your neurologist, so there are situations where you might notice that you take levodopa and the dyskinesia you had, instead of worsening, improves. These are the dyskinesias that call, they're coming from not enough levodopa. And that's, they're called biphasic because you see them at the beginning of the effect of levodopa, when it's, levodopa is going up in the blood, and when levodopa is going down again, when it's wearing off. So you see dyskinesias, not dyskinesias, dyskinesias again. That's why they're called biphasic. In some cases, we also have biphasic, but also the peak dose dyskinesia. So people have dyskinesias when the medication kicks in, then they do well. The excessive movements because the medication is too high, and then good mobility, and then dyskinesias again. Reason why your doctor asks you, okay, you have dyskinesias. What time do you have dyskinesias? Um, they probably ask you, okay, with respect to the dose of levodopa, when do you see the dyskinesias? Trying to figure out what to do next. Because if it's biphasic, you need to increase the dose. If it's peak dose, you need to reduce the dose. Uh, the question is bradykinesia and dyskinesia at the same time. So in some situations, you may have dyskinesias when levodopa hasn't fully kicked in. So Parkinson's is no well treated, and yet you have dyskinesias. That's why you can have the combination. Uh, in, in this case, it would be biphasic dyskinesias. And usually biphasic dyskinesias affects the legs and it's painful. So lower limbs, so legs moving while the rest of the body is stiff, typical of biphasic dyskinesias. Um, and then maybe the dyskinesias go away and you have the peak dose dyskinesia, which typically affect the, part, the central part of the body, the trunk. So even from the location, sometimes we can understand what type of dyskinesia it is. That is very, very like complicated and complex. Yeah. So it's important that we're discussing this because um, we hear about dyskinesia, obviously, but we, we don't really even necessarily talk about the biphasic and what it might look like in terms of the peaks and the troughs and how people can communicate that. Yep. So thank you so much. Um, I just had another question come in. If medication is no longer working and DBS is no longer an option, is is this considered in stage Parkinson's, and, and and is that something that we see like in terms of bradykinesia getting all of these things just kind of getting slower and slower and just not responding any longer? Yeah, um, so that's a difficult question, uh, but equally important. Um, so let me say first of all, the DBS tends to do what medications do. Uh, the difference is that DBS is continuous. So if you have a problem and it doesn't respond to levodopa, chances are that it won't respond to DBS, um, with the exception of tremor and dyskinesias. But actually, sometimes DBS stops dyskinesias. But all the rest, if it doesn't improve with levodopa, it won't improve with DBS. Yet we do it exactly like we do pumps, because we want the brain to be on a constant level of something. And I, I mentioned earlier the biphasic and peak dose at the same time, meaning that you need to be in a narrow range and that's when you are you need something continuous, and that can be DBS or the pumps. Actually, I saw 
in one of the questions, the, the question about subcutaneous levodopa, and yeah, sure, subcutaneous levodopa will exactly do that. It will give you a steady state of levodopa. It works, but if levodopa doesn't work taken orally, it won't work given in a continuous infusion. Okay, that's important. So with disease progression, the, uh, the symptoms of Parkinson's tend to become more and more resistant to levodopa, but not all of them. Rigidity tends to respond all the time. Bradyganesia responds, but not to the level that responded before. So that's why if you have Parkinson's, you will be taking levodopa forever. It's not that we stop levodopa, oh, because it doesn't work anymore, there's no point, unless maybe you have DBS and DBS does a good job. So uh, um, it's possible in this case to end up with a problem with balance, with freezing of gait, with speech. That's typical of later stages of Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, what to do next? Well, this is why we have research and research is now looking into new drugs that work in circuits different than the dopaminergic ones. So it's no longer around the dopamine, but other molecules, other neurotransmitters, as well as new targets for neuromodulation, uh, different spots in the brain that we've been uh, experimenting for the past 20 years. So far, nothing really, really a substitute of what we do, but uh, we are not giving up and we're working and trying to resolve these problems. Fantastic. Um, so I know this isn't specific to bradykinesia, but I think because we are talking about a lot of this overlap of these symptoms, um, they're wanting to know about tremors such as head yeah. tremor and distinguishing that from a dyskinesia. Absolutely. That's a great point. Uh, because it's a common situation I've been uh, experiencing in myself and other colleagues of mine, situations where uh, um, the person calls the office or sends an email or something, and they say, my tremor is worse. Um, okay, and then we increase levodopa or whatever medication we're using. And the patient, again, calls back, oh, it's even worse now. And later on, when the person finally comes to our office, we realize that what the person was calling tremor was dyskinesias, and that therefore we had to do the opposite of increasing the medication. But it's easy to uh, distinguish the two actually. Tremor is rhythmic, dyskinesias is chaotic. So anything that does a constant movement in the head would be like this or this. If it's rhythmic, doing the same thing, you know, go to uh, sort of um, uh, back and forth, it's a tremor. If it's seemingly chaotic, you cannot predict where the next movement will be. It's like a sort of a slow dance. That's dyskinesias. So that's important because, as you can tell, it will uh, dictate the management that the neurologist will use. Fantastic. Well, I, I just have to say that I was one of the people that really did not understand the depth of bradykinesia until I saw that uh, paper that was was published and the foundation for today's talk. So I think it's been very, very helpful to have you explain some of these and how they're interconnected with, with some of the symptoms that we see. So thank you for taking your time. I don't know if there's any last comments or things that we didn't cover in the questions that you might want to share with our audience yeah. before we end. Yeah, I want to say uh, three things. Uh, the first and foremost, it is important that you all get educated because this is a team effort. And if you don't know even the terms we use, you don't give us the right information or you even worse, you give us misleading information and we don't go anywhere. So it's important that you have a grasp on the complexity of the disease. So, number one. Number two, there was a question about PISA syndrome. I just want to briefly mention that PISA syndrome is when the trunk leans on one side, and usually the person is not even aware of it. Um, and that's a combination of muscle stiffness on one side, weakness on the other side, but also poor awareness of the space. And lastly, I saw a question about DBS for a typical Parkinsonism. And in general, the answer is no. It's not advisable to do it because DBS most of the time makes things worse. Reason why, before you get DBS, make sure that you're seen by someone who knows what they're talking about, that it's a center that does many implants, that they have experience because it's, it, DBS is something that can actually make you worse. 
They want to know if you will repeat the word for the trunk leaning. Pisa Tower, like in Italy, the Pisa Tower. <laughs> that's that's why you need an Italian doctor to tell you about it. So Pisa Tower Syndrome uh, is the term when people lean on one side. Fantastic. Okay, well, I want to thank you so much for this. And we're getting comments. This is the best talk on bradykinesia they've ever heard. Thank and you. honestly, to, to be able to have this depth of discussion, I think it's been very helpful for all of us. So we have a better understanding. It's a lot more complex than, than we really thought that it was. Um, and you did mention something about orthostasis or neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Tomorrow we actually have another program. It's specific to neurogenic orthostatic hypotension or NOH you might hear. So if you guys want to join us tomorrow for that, um, we're going to be delving into those symptoms and treatment options for that. So Dr. Fasano, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your time and expertise. My pleasure. Thank you all and uh, stay healthy. Drink water and exercise. That's the most important thing, I guess, at this point. Fantastic. Yeah. And we have a tradition at PMD Alliance of giving you a wave across the United States and beyond of our thanks. So <laughs> I'll invite everybody to give you the wave. <laughs> to Thank send you. you off with many thanks. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. <laughs>